Hey everyone, thank you for joining. You are watching the Inside Track Pathways in Broadcast hosted by our very own Craig Wilson with Andrew Chow, Emily Clulo and Liam Berkery. Now I'm, uh, I'm not the host here, so I'm just gonna go through some housekeeping rules really. So everyone kind of knows how to use the Q and A and really make sure that you've got the time to, I guess, get as much information as you can out of our awesome guest hosts here and guest panelists. So just in case you haven't been on a Zoom webinar yet in the last two years, uh, please reference the below Q&A button there just to ask uh, everyone your questions. Um, now, please feel free to use your name. Let us know what school you're from, if you are currently a student or even if you're an ex-student and you just graduated. But we want to know where you're from, what you want to know, essentially, just so we can give you a bit of a shout out. But yeah, please feel free to utilize this as much as possible. And the reason why it's purely because we're also giving away a license. So in case you forgot, we're giving away a one year subscription to Media Composer Ultimate um, for the lucky kind of winner if you've uh, registered and currently are attending live. Now, if you are watching on social streams at the moment, I'm going to put a link into the chats. So just keep a lookout onto that. So you can register and join the webinar live just so you've also got a fair chance to kind of go in the running. But key tip, or I guess a little bit of a hint, uh, the more questions you ask or the best question you ask might bump up your chances a little bit more. Um, so without further ado, I will just quickly intro our guest speakers. I'm sure you've seen them all on socials and on the landing page, but we're joined by Andrew Chow, uh, Emily Clulo, and Liam Berkery. So they all kind of know each other quite well. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of friendly banter going on today. So it should be a really interesting session. And without further ado, I'm going to throw it over to the host, who is Craig Wilson. Um, just as a cheeky little plug in there, Craig currently hosts the Making of Media podcast. So if you want to get out your phones now um, and just click that QR code, because I'm sure, you know, we're all used to scanning QR codes now at this point. But if you click that QR code or I guess scan that on your phone, uh, that will take you to the Spotify page so you can learn more about what Craig's been doing on that side. Really interesting sessions there. So Craig, without further ado, that's enough from me. Uh, I'm gonna throw it over to you and yeah, have fun everyone. That's great, Shauna. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, so as Shauna said, uh, my name is Craig Wilson. I am the product evangelist for media and cloud um, here at Avid. I'm actually based over in the UK, so joining uh, relatively early in the morning for me. Uh, but we've got a great panel to, uh, to, to keep us all interested and, and stimulated for the next um, hour or so. Uh, and please, please feel free to, uh, to use the Q&A function uh, and to get your questions in to uh, Liam, uh, Andrew and Emily. Uh, and I'll put them to them you know, later um, in, the, in the webinar. But here, you know, we're, we're here to talk about, you know, the insight track and pathways um, into, into broadcast. But to start, I think it's, it's maybe worthwhile just to chat a little bit um, about what each of our guests actually do today. And then we'll look back and look at how they got into uh, the industry as well. So, so Liam, to, to start with, um, explain a little bit about what you do now. Uh, currently, I'm a freelance editor and I've been working at Channel 9 Australia for the last, well, essentially the last year. Uh, we've had a funny year because we got hacked early in the year in our new building and then COVID kicked along. So I've actually been working pretty much exclusively on the rugby union coverage. And I've actually been doing all of that from my garage and delivering it via cloud services, et cetera, and dealing with the media management and all of that. So it's been an interesting year. Yeah, it certainly has been an interesting year for, for, for all of us, I guess. And Emily, handing across to you now, explain a little bit about, about what you do now. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm an editor at um, Channel 9 as well uh, in Wide World of Sports. And, um, yeah, like Liam said, it's been a very interesting year for us uh, on a, for a number of reasons. So I've also been working from home uh, probably at least half the time. So it's been interesting um, uh, managing media, ingesting, all that sort of stuff a bit more myself this year as well as um, working across sports, so rugby league, um, tennis, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, working on teasers and openers, um, some small action playoffs and, and even just overlay, that sort of thing. So it's a good mix um, of things we get to work with and producers. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to be here. 
Yeah, I guess one thing that the last year has highlighted is we may well be working in the industry, but things in the industry change all the time as well. So we'll maybe talk a little bit about being adaptable and, and how to, to look at those things as well. Um, Andrew, how about you? Explain a little bit about what you do today. Yeah, so up until a couple of months ago, I was working like Liam and M at, at the Nine Network. Um, difference there being, though, I worked in the engineering technology teams, um, doing a lot of building of workflows and technical systems. And uh, now I have out on my own and I'm doing a lot of training and, and working with other broadcasters and tech systems, uh, building their own systems and, and navigating this crazy world we live in now. So it's great. We've got a range of sort of different different experiences. And, and while I worked for Avid, you know, first 20 years of my career, I was a journalist. So, you know, my, my career's changed. And again, I think we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, so, Andrew, to, to kick off then, how did you get your first break and get into the industry? I mean, my, mine was a little bit different at the time. So I didn't do university. I didn't go to college or anything like that. I just straight out of high school, did a bit of work for for Channel 7 on a couple of broadcasts and, you know, got out there and did some some uh, volunteer jobs and and really got tried to get my name out there as much as I could um, in that space, purely because I didn't know what I wanted to do at that stage. I was still fresh out of high school and I, at the time working for, for Krispy Kreme. So, you know, first job, not having any idea of how entertainment worked or broadcast or anything like that. Uh, but it was one one event that I did for Channel 7 that I, I met the, the tech teams and, and, and got really interested in that sort of stuff. And uh, one of my best friends also worked for Nine and, and got me an interview um, on the side as well. I'm a master pyrotechnician, so I happened to be out on, on a show doing a show and I got a call from, from the Nine guys saying that they had a, a junior position open for me. Um, coming from an interview, I remember rocking up straight off, off the field, um, gunpowder all over my hands, sweaty and smelly. Luckily, thankfully to them, they, they gave me the job the next day. So um, then just, you know, started doing little things, um, working with incoming feeds, putting it to VHS back then and and then working my way up. But, um, you know, there's multiple ways in. And like I said, I didn't do university or anything like that. So I was just getting my name out there and just trying everything I could and and trying the different things and meeting the people and trying to get, get in that way. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, Emily, what about you? Um, so I went to um, my local university in Newcastle, um, so about two hours north of Sydney, and studied a three-year bachelor degree. Um, and I think I got to um, probably halfway through my final year when I started to panic because I realised um, how few jobs there seemed to be, um, like ads, and I had no experience. I was like, why would anyone ever pay me any money? Oh, my God, what have I done? Um, and so, yeah, so I think... Um, I started just going for any kind of internship I could and luckily um, was picked to do a two-week full-time placement at Foxtel in Sydney, um, which was really eye-opening, um, sort of rotated through a, a bunch of different things, uh, areas as well to see like promo producers or like the ingesting team and all that sort of stuff. So it was really good. But um, come to the end of the year, I just I found a job posting on LinkedIn um, for a freelance editor position at the Sunday footy show at, at Wide World of Sports and um, just immediately, like, jumped at it because, again, I'd seen basically no job ads anywhere that seemed relevant to me or to my interests. And so I was like, this, I need to do this. So Spess basically dropped everything that day and um, sort of, built a few things into my Twitter about rugby league, a few tweets, put it, uh, <laughs> changed my LinkedIn to be a little bit more relevant um, and then got my CV in and I somehow got the call the next day for an interview. So, yeah, and um, actually, interestingly enough, I, I'm not sure if Liam was in the room that day, but when I went in for my interview, I um, <laughs> had to sit down at the app and they're like, right, we just need to see if you can actually edit. I was like, ooh, okay. I'd, I downloaded the trial for Avid because I'd never used it before at uni. We used Final Cut. And so I, I had a pretty, you know, light idea of how to do it. I was like, oh, my God. And, like, Liam and I think two other editors and two producers were there standing over me. I was, I was putting in dissolves. I was like, I could do this and managed to survive that. And I got the job. So <laughs> I feel like eight years have flown. So that's sort of where I I got into it, but it was hard. I think that initial point, not really knowing anyone, but you can do it. Cuts are always better and just cuts. Oh, <laughs> <look. dissolves. laughs> we know yeah, some cut. producers want those dissolved six frames. Come on. Yeah. Cuts and static shots, no pans, no zooms, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, 
so so uh, so uh, Emily and Andrew obviously different pathways in. Uh, Liam, what about you? Uh, mine's a bit different again because I grew up in TV. My father worked in TV, as did my mother for a short time. So I was around it all my life. That being said, I had no ambitions to work in TV. I, I think part of me thought I'd be a rock star, which obviously didn't happen. But as a teenager, yes. I, <laughs> as a teenager, I got a summer job just making cups of tea at the cricket. And that then led to dragging cables around rugby league fields and that sort of thing just on weekends. And school finished and I sort of was a bit lost. But what I discovered by that time was I like TV people and I like the idea of working with the sort of people that I've been around because they're a strange mix and there's a little bit of something for everybody. And obviously all through that time I kept doing these odd jobs in TV and that led to me actually getting a very base level job at Channel 9 back in 1994 in the transfers department doing VHSs and archive records. And I think at that stage I'd sort of thought that I'd probably lean towards audio with my love of music and I looked at going to the School of Audio Engineering and stuff, but I found myself in videotapes and the natural progression sort of led to editing and I, I learned on analogue one-inch machines, editing and doing on-air tapes, which then led to a bit of editing on beta cam and desks and online editing. I also operated EVSs and did videotapes doing on our replays and that sort of thing on football and cricket and promos, everything. I sort of found myself online editing all the lifestyle and reality programs, views and current affairs. But obviously the one constant through all of that was sport. And I found myself, I think from about 2003 to 2019, I was the one editing state of origin openers and grand final openers and all those sorts of things. I joined the actual sport department in 2008. And from then to 2019, I was the one of, if not the only senior editor at Wide World of Sports through all that time. And took a redundancy in 2019 and went back to work for them, full-time freelance, living the dream. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think what's really interesting there, and I think for, for people who are looking to get into the industry, is you might think when you're outside looking in that, you know, everyone's got a plan and they come in, they know what they want to do. But I think in reality, you know, people, are, it's about kind of taking opportunity. And I think, Andrew, what, what you kind of indicated is you mentioned that you also work in the pyrotechnics side of things and I think that's that's an interesting aspect of, of, of what you do. But you go in not really perhaps knowing ultimately what it is that you want to do. No, definitely not. Like I've obviously being a pyrotechnician, that's very creative and I did a lot of soundtracks and things like that. And I didn't know how to edit. I'd never even heard of things like Avid or, or Media Composer or things like that. And then when I started in, because I started in, fun enough, the same department that Liam did in, in transfers, I saw the other side of it, the, the non-creative, the, the things that potentially that doesn't always get the recognition, the, the people that are behind the scenes that push the buttons and, and make things work behind the scenes and that technology growth i mean i was in that department when we went um, hd from sd broadcasting and and went through that world so the workflows and all the happenings behind the scenes then took my interest and that's then where i went to but there were, there were people that i worked with then that went off and did producing or went off and, and left the industry altogether thinking you know there's nothing here for me or some that just went and did admin reception work so uh, it's you got to get your feet in the door to begin with, and once you do, it's it's like a, a maze of all the different things that could happen, and, and it can be achieved. And and just you know, you make some decisions and go different paths, and make your own own way, and see how see where it gets you. Yeah, um, Emily, you mentioned something there about doing, you know, a, sort of a, a small couple of weeks of experience at, at, at Foxtel. How do you think that kind of benefited what you did? And again, you know, Liam, I may come to you as well. You, you talked about starting making the tea, you know, it is things like that that can just get your feet in the door and, and kind of get you known. So Emily, what do you think you benefited from, from trying to do that kind of experience? I think for me, um, that placement, um, while it was also probably the first time I'd worked 
full-time hours um, like Monday to Friday. So first of all, that was an eye-opener, very exhausting. Um, but it was really interesting for me because I didn't really have a great understanding despite having, you know, being two and a half years into a university degree of all of the different roles you can fulfill uh, in TV and, and how you can contribute to the broadcast. Um, so it was really good um, to see like how many people can just work on one project and bring it together. So, and, and the different ways, you know, like you you might not want a creative role, like what um, Charlie was saying, you know, there are so many different things needed just to get it up and running. Um, but if you are more creative, you know, like I remember sitting in with a promo producer and thinking, this is really cool. Like he's, you know, basically being unleashed with no one sort of really sitting with him just to let his brain go wild and see what he can make out of this. And that really appealed to me. So um, I remember speaking to the guy that sort of organised the placement program and saying, well, yeah, I, I've come away from this and like, I think I figured out that that's the sort of thing I want to do. Like, it's so cool. And I remember he was a really nice guy. He, he was like, well, you know, that sort of job, you probably have to, you know, this is the sort of hierarchy. You have to go in this role and then move on to that. And it's probably a 10-year progression before you'll even get a chance to cut stuff for yourself. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, oh, that's just, that doesn't sound right. Like, I'm probably not going to do that. Like, I, I don't know. There's probably another way around it because I want to get there quicker, you know, which... It's not always the best way, but, um, yeah, and I guess in a way um, it just made my brain think because I'm quite competitive. <laughs> it's like how can I make it work for me and and how can I achieve my dream, which at the time was promo producer because that's all I knew. Um, and I think that's really helped me, you know, even going from job to job thinking, well, this is not quite the job I want, but what can I learn from it to build, like to have a greater understanding of the whole broadcast, like whether it's running an auto queue or working as a graphic artist or a director's assistant, because it all builds up that understanding of the world of broadcast. And so now as an editor, I understand what they need from me, it, whether it's technical or otherwise, um, just to make everyone's lives easier and a, a better broadcast at the end of the day. So I think that really helped me, that placement. I think just just feeding off what Amnes said there, like as well, when you start, when you finally have an idea of what you actually want to do and where you want to go, the technology around that has changed so dramatically that there's yeah. a new, new channel or something else that's opened up. You go, oh, well, actually, I'm interested in this, but this is something new that can I grab this and how does that then relate to this? And okay, well, you know, here's a whole new part. There's also like, lucky what you said, you know, when I started, we were still working on tapes and we didn't have an ABS or anything like that yet. But then by the time, like, in, I mean, it's only been eight years. It's not a long career by any measure. But the amount of technological changes, I think there are so many new jobs that have popped up in that time as well, you know, and it's it's pretty amazing, you know, I think. Especially to, thanks to COVID as well. Yeah, COVID exactly. brought the cloud and work from home and, and all that sort of stuff that as, a, as an engineer, like, we, we were down the path of an SDI cable came in here and plugged into here and, and we start looking at both those ends. And now it's, well, you know, at Amazon Web Services and you know, all these different things that start bringing in new workflows and new challenges that just explode over a really small period of time. In all fairness, if we could still plug in SDI cables, we would have gotten around the hack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Liam, I mean, you, you talked about the kind of the varied career that you've had as well. How, how important do you think it is for people when they do get in, that they do try and embrace opportunities that perhaps come along, that they might think... I'm not entirely sure this is the right thing for, for, for me, but I'm given an opportunity and perhaps I should take it. I think massively important because that's one of those things when you're young, you don't realise everything that you don't know. You might know a lot, but you have no idea how much stuff you don't know. And sorry, never mind young, just starting out, however old you may be. Um, when I got moved from the videotape department to being an editor, that were in in the days where edit suites were very large mixing boards, audio mixers, everything else, graphic chirons, that sort of thing. At that time, I wanted to be a director and I got persuaded to come down to the editing department. I went, come and give it a try. And if you don't like it, if nothing else, you have learned how a studio control room works, every bit of it. And from that, when I was working on outside broadcasts, I was, I remember Two times in particular, one was at Wimbledon. I was there as the videotape operator. Obviously, it's long hours and small crew. 
the audio director had to go out and go to the bathroom. So I used to run in and sit and be the audio director because I knew how a audio desk worked. And similar one time at New York, working on the tennis again, our vision switcher was stuck in a bus that got lost somewhere in Queens and we were coming up to go on air. So I got pulled out of videotapes and sat in front of the vision desk and was all ready to go and switch the opening segment. And that was all stuff that I'd learned in the edit suite. And everything you learn along the way feeds something else. Everything I learned working as a tape operator in a studio environment has helped me as an editor because I understand what the audio director might need from, even if it's a simple piece of audio that you need to have tidy ends on the overlay because they're not pulling down every fader and little things like that, just how to help those people. And it's, yeah, and there's been other strange jobs along the way. When I did that tennis, it was the one year anniversary of September 11. And I got asked to hang around and help. And I was a floor manager, audio assistant, anything that could be for four days straight. And experiences like that, every experience helps. doesn't matter what you're doing, where you are. It's also the people you work with. Like so much of what I do now, editing, be it a teaser or a feature story or anything, I've learned everything you cut's essentially a story at heart. And I've learned so much about storytelling from working with great producers and or journos. And it may be cutting feature stories on cricket cricketers or obituaries or cutting film reviews and stuff like that. Like I learned a lot cutting film reviews with a great person here called Peter Thompson. That's where I learned that if you try and do a cut and the two shots don't work, putting in a dissolve won't work. The two shots don't go together, little basic things like that. But, yeah, you just never stop learning. You learn it from everybody. You know, there's so much to learn about audio, vision, technical stuff. It's, yeah, everything everything feeds every other job. It's symbiotic, for lack of a better word. Yeah. I mean, you brought up a great thing there, Liam, about, about learning from, from, from other people um, as well. So I think when people maybe get into the, the industry, if they are lucky enough to get in, they, they maybe feel intimidated by, they look around themselves as people who've been there perhaps for, for a long time. What, what kind of advice would you give to people about you know, seeking out mentoring or seeking out help? Um, because I know that I've benefited so much from people I've worked with in my career who've been able to pass on their experience to me. So what advice would you give to, to people who perhaps are in and, and perhaps feel, well, I can't go and ask that person or, you know, that person's been doing this for a long time and I'm a bit embarrassed or a bit shy. What would you say to them? Uh, I think you just touched on it then. Ask is the first thing. Um, when I learned to edit, actually it was the same all throughout my career, I learned on the job. I didn't go to an editing course or anything. I got sat next to somebody. They taught me how the edit suite worked. They taught me how to put shows together and the form for shows. But I was a senior editor for a long time and, and that sort of disappeared a bit, that way of working. But I was always open to anybody coming and asking. And if anybody ever wanted to come and sit with me and watch or wanted me to sit and watch them work, because the other thing I found, particularly when I started on Avid, I came from my linear background, the Avid 101 course at the time, and I sat and watched it. And with Avid, there's, let's say there's five or six ways to do any one job. And what I learned from it was you sit and see the five or six ways and you work out that's the way I like, that's the way I'm going to work. And... I've seen it happen a lot and I've sat with people and vice versa. And the more you sit with other people, and I've even done this with people that I've worked with for 25, 30 years, you sit and you see other stuff and go, oh, I didn't know about that. That's quite good. I'm going to adopt that. But it's just ask because, look, obviously there are times where people are very focused on their jobs and have work to do. But also I don't know of many editors that wouldn't be happy to have a junior editor sit with them. And that's probably true of any other broadcast job. And I know it's something I, I was chatting with a, another freelance friend of mine, it's something he discussed that I know he'd be happy to mentor young kids. And even sometimes it's not 
if you're doing a job, sure, sometimes you can't sit and explain every single little edit, but if you just sit and watch, you see so much. And there's a lot to learn, even, even just things going, oh, I didn't know I can do that. And you might be able to teach them how to do it, but just being aware, okay, I should be able to do that. It gives you that scope to then explore, knowing what the machine's capable of. I remember... Yeah, I think um, you the... Oh, you go. So you, you go. Oh, I was just going to say, say um, I, like for me, like what you were saying, Liam, I, um, that was such a huge thing for me because, you know, despite uni degree, I learned more on the job or all of my editing skills pretty much on the job or at home, you know, just playing around um, by getting on the tools. So, and I think that, um, you know, it, it is intimidating, especially when you're in a new place you've never been before and it's all exciting and new and you don't know you maybe the etiquette of certain things, but just like most people are really friendly and really nice. Like Liam, you know, when I started, I sat with Liam a lot. I sat with all the editors to see just how everyone had their quirks. And I, you know, you pick the things like what Liam said that work for you. And I think it's like you formulate your own workflow based on that. And like for me, you know, the watching thing was the most interesting thing. You don't have to ask all well, what like questions every time. Like I went out uh, with Liam to an outdoor broadcast for the NRL grand final. So as you can imagine, pretty hectic, uh, very fast turnaround editing, um, you know, relatively high level of stress. And you just sit in the corner and you just watch everyone, the interactions with when people would come in and talk to him or talk to him over the talk back and see like, okay, what's he saying? He's only using it for certain, um, I guess, uh, communications just to say I'm sending something down now or whatever. And, and like, you can see, oh, he's recording vision in, right. Okay. I can, I can see why he's doing that. It's just, you, you start taking all these things in, you're writing notes. And then the next time you sit at the Abbott, you're kind of like, oh yeah, the, it makes sense why they were doing that now. I can, it's all clicks together. And I feel like, I don't think I've ever met someone that wasn't happy to let me be a, a shadow or a sponge next to them, stealing all their knowledge. <laughs> like it's, it's so helpful. Or borrowing you then, borrowing you. Yeah. Yeah. Mimicking. Yeah, Cause I was just from the, the technology side, I think it's um, shadowing someone is sometimes the only way to get things um, across and understood purely because, you know, not everyone has a, an Abbott system in their bedroom that's capable of 600 plus users or an EBS system that is connected to a, a Viz system or anything like that. So, you know, sometimes shift work does make some people look a bit scary, but I don't know of, like you say, anyone that isn't happy or doesn't want people to shadow them and, and learn, learn off them. Obviously, there's some things that you probably shouldn't learn off some people, given some of the history of some people, but... Um, did you, you know, want to know names? Means, <laughs> nope, I'm keeping that one to myself. <laughs> but I mean, if there's if if I'm in a in a CTR room, or a CTF room, going through a, a rack layout and trying to troubleshoot something, I would love to have some juniors or some people that are not so necessarily switched on to to what I'm doing. So if it means that if it happens, something happens again, and it saves me ten minutes because other people know um, how things work, then all well and good. It makes makes my job easier and and they're learning at the same time. So, and it's all those little things that, um, again, like you probably don't see from the front end and, and how video gets from the camera to you guys and then from the camera to studio and, and on from there. So, you know, I, I think the, it's all well and good to have these um, fantastic certificates, not saying there's anything wrong with uni courses or anything like that, but um, getting actual on the ground, getting your hands dirty, um, from a technology side, at least, I think is is probably the best way to get things sorted and understood. I've I've never gone for a job interview where anybody's asked to look at a certificate. Same. I didn't yep, have one to show. <laughs> I think it's a it's a really fair point. So, Andrew, you talked a little bit about about technology there, and obviously, technology is something that that, that really has changed. We have actually got a, a question that's come in from 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 Abbas, who's asking, "What about the technology changes that you've seen in, in the last few years? How important do you think it is for people to a kind of adapt to, to to change when they're in the industry? And what do you think the big changes really really have been? I mean, obviously, the last eighteen months has been kind of extraordinary, but but technology changes all the time. So, Andrew, starting off with you. Uh, well, I mean, I, digital has been my world for multiple years and um, obviously being in the technical lead on, on 
latest nine project really opened my eyes to all the different things that are out there. Um, I think obviously I went through the SD to HD transition, um, not old enough to do the black and white to color, but it just it might not have seen much of a, a difference no, going from SD to HD. I, I'm not saying anything. Like I said, I'm not naming names. But it, it's working in the technology space is the biggest challenge that I've always found is is if you when you start working on a project, you always have the resources and, and the technology around you that you have to work with. Projects like that of a scale that, that Nine had the last couple of years always grow exponentially really quickly. So making Having an idea and, and sitting on that for those years isn't always going to work because there is obviously um, IP infrastructure and, and then cloud and then COVID hits and then you need to get 600 people out of one room to their houses and then getting media to them and back and forth and the introduction to um, the cloud space and things like that. I think um, although a lot of people in society now have taken a step back and are doing things from home and slowing down, the media industries, especially from the technology side, has grown and it's all these little, little projects and technology resources that potentially were being planned to be rolled out over three, four, five years is now being done in four or five weeks. Um, nine, at the time when we had that the cyber incident, we had a number of things going. Not only did we just roll out and go live with the new system, we were still getting through people that are learning these technologies at the, at the same time. Some of those engineers were still learning those technologies at the same time and growing, but then we had to keep the broadcast running. That was the most important thing out of the whole whole lot. And if it meant we had to go off and, and bring people in that specialise only in media composer or specialise only in 2110 backbones, it probably not have been the most practical and easiest way and cost effective. But um, we had to not only keep that broadcast running, but keep progressing with it and making sure that we tied in all those, those loose ends. Uh, the biggest challenge is, is like that. It's not so much, I think, one one type of technology or one framework, um, 2110 and IP and, or, and the cloud are definitely where things are headed, um, whether we're, we're there or not, depending on who you, who you talk to. Um, but it, it's, I think the challenge overall is making sure that you, you know where you've come from, you know the workflows and, and the capabilities of your system you have, what is there, 4K, 8K, 16K, however makes you anxious, and then making sure that you can get to that point without doing these ones and have a, have a clear understanding of what you're actually doing and is it the best option. Sometimes going 4K might not be the easiest way. It might be for <laughs> the end user sitting in front of their TV and they go, well, why aren't we all 4K? But there are so many things leading up to that that are not quite there technically that we can say, okay, we'll, we'll flick a switch and we'll broadcast from XD cam all the way through to 4K and, and everyone at home on their 4K monitors or whatever can be able to see every single single frame. So. I think that's more of the challenge rather than the technology itself. Yeah. Emily, I wanted to pick up on something you actually mentioned right, right back at the, at the start was, you know, you went in for, for the interview and, and, and Liam and others sat around you looking to edit on Avid and you perhaps didn't really know Avid very well because you'd learned on Final Cut. And I think one other thing that, that, that I would suggest is that people should learn as many tools as possible. It's not just about learning Composer. Maybe it's about doing Premiere, about doing Final Cut, or or it's about working it up with with Media Central, or it's working with EMPS. So don't be limited by the sort of tool set that you you have, and and try to learn as much um, of the different tools that are available. What, what do you think about that? Absolutely, I think the more that you know, whether it's different programs. Um, whether it's, uh, say, ENPS for news um, or EBS. Like, the more you know, I, I guess, the better you're placed in terms of an asset to wherever you want to work, you're more valuable. So, of course, they're going to want to hire you that way because it's easy. They don't have to train you on as much then, that, you know. Um, but for me, you know, like, the first thing I edited on was iMovie on my iMac back in high school, which was uh, riveting, I'm sure, for my parents to watch back then. Um, but then, yeah, like, in, in uni, we had Final Cut. So I learnt to use that because that's all I had available to me. I didn't really have anything else at home um, that was, I guess, above that consumer level. Um, and, and for me, you know, I think 
if you can understand the fundamentals of editing, so whether it's storytelling or if you're more interested in technical editing, whether it's like compiling vision or something like that, um, you know, I think if you can understand that, you can use any program. It, it was just that adjustment period, learning where all the different buttons are, because essentially a lot of the functions are the same for the most part. So, you know, um, like I worked for a year um, at Optus Sport um, halfway through my career at, uh, and they were on Premiere and using it full Adobe suite. So, you know, that was an adjustment period for me because I'd primarily been on Avid, even though I have Premiere at home, like my, my go-to has always been Avid from once I got into that first job. So, you know, like I think that, um, being able to jump between programs, um, it, it just makes you more versatile and, and things are less stressful because, you know, like whether even it takes you a week or something to acclimatize, you're like, right, okay, I've got the keyboard in front of me. I know there are shortcuts and they're all different, but um, yeah, Google's your friend as well. So <laughs> there are tutorials everywhere. Yeah, yeah it's probably worth also mentioning that, um, that there is a free trial, of, there's a, a free version of Media Composer that's available yes. now called Media Composer First. So again, if you want to, you know, get something and, and don't have to, you know, spend any money on it, that's something else that, that, that you can also so, so do. Uh, Liam, I, I was going to come to you because as someone who's also been involved in the hiring process, when you're looking for people, what are the kind of things that you're looking for from, from people that are coming in? You know, is it an academic background? Is it practical experience or just a willingness to learn, I guess? Uh, it's funny you mentioned that because I was actually thinking about it earlier today. Um, it's certainly not academic. That's never come into it, obviously. But then it also depends on what level of editor you're looking to replace or hire. Um, there's been quite a few occasions where I've had meetings with people and we've been discussing the sort of person we want. And there have been occasions where rather than hiring somebody that's slightly more established, we've actually lent towards getting somebody that's more junior in the regard that then we can sort of mould them to how we want them to edit. That may sound bad, but that's not certainly not going, you cut like this, but going, this is how we do things here, rather than unlearning a system that they may have done. And again, it, I guess that sort of leans on the mentoring thing that we've been speaking about. It's about... Teach, you're teaching people along the way. Um, we've done it with quite a few people and had great success. Um, and this sort of touches on something that we haven't really touched on. Like, I think a lot of people, when they think of editing, think of it as being this amazing creative process where everything's an artistic struggle. But in broadcast, there are so many editing jobs which, not sound unkind, but aren't massively creative they're jobs that need to be done and in that regard it's horses for courses some people are really suited to there are some jobs where you just need to pump out it may be lots of overlay which if you're watching this and not familiar with the term we're talking about 30 seconds of vision of football highlights or something like that not exciting stuff to cut but at the same time if you've got to cut 30 pieces of it that's a challenge so, you know, yep, you're probably not going to put it on your show rail, but if that's something you can do and pump out 30 pieces of overlay in two hours and get the show to wear, that's an achievement in itself. So, again, there are all those sorts of things, you know, and they're, all right, we won't get this person to put them on to make an opener for the Olympics, but they'll be great at the Olympics pumping out three-minute highlights packages and things like that. And then that other stuff might come later. Yeah, and I think you, you, you both, you've all sort of touched on it as well, is there is such a wide range of jobs within the industry and there are new jobs that are coming along. We, you know, when I started in journalism, it was typewriters back in that, those days. Yes, I am, I am really that old. But the whole concept of a digital journalist just didn't exist you know, in, 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 in those times. And, you know, that has changed so much and other opportunities have, have, have come along. So, so, Andrew, from your perspective of how things have changed, maybe looking at the last 18 months or so, the last couple of years, even that's opened up, you know, other opportunities as well. So it is a, a constantly changing industry, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, just, just going back and touching on, on there, what Liam was saying, from, from an engineering side of things, there is no way that um, an engineer should 
know an editing platform enough to cut all those overlays or anything like that, but it is using things like those MIDI Composer first or, or those DaVinci Resolve applications that are, that are free. The good thing is there are so many applications out there, things that are on your phone even that you can go out and you can go and shoot whatever you want in 4K, 2K, HD, then bring it into your laptop and, and do rough editing. I think from, from an engineering point of view, you're not expected to know, you know th where this cable goes, how that cable was soldered together, or how that, all that sort of stuff, but, but know the applications and the technology enough that you can then say, oh, hey, well, the next steps are part of the workflow and you grow, you keep growing segment by segment. There's no um, overall, I know this application inside out because by the time you do get across that so heavily, technology has changed. Um, the biggest things that I've seen in the, in the last couple of months is definitely when uh, with the Nine project, we, we spent a good part of two, three years trying to work out the, the overall workflows. And then when we start building the project and over the next 10 months, the, the workflows itself had then changed. So the original scope that we put in place at the very beginning then didn't reflect what we had at the end. So there were so many change requests and change opportunities in there. We had, we were bringing in, we're breaking up segments and breaking up the project enough that we were bringing in extra people just to, to help. And because the timeline doesn't change, we have to not only keep the original site and the original broadcast running and, but then get these people across, train them in a timely manner that we can then get them online and on air um, quick enough that we're ahead of the game enough that we're not then already backtracking before we even go live. Uh, but like I said, there's new positions coming up all the time. And I think um, a lot of respect goes to the support teams that, that do get um, not, not so much attention um, across the technology teams that keeping in mind that they do have to support the people, the editors, the, the creatives, but then also if something goes wrong in studio, they've got to keep, they've got to know how a studio works. They've got to know how a graphic element gets on and how things get from, from Liam and Liam's team to studio and then on originally, uh, eventually to on air. So those guys are definitely under the pump. In the long term, those guys are going to know so much of, of the workflow itself that they can then adapt better moving forward. Uh, not to not to diss on editors by any means, but um, if it wasn't for the technology and the support guys, Liam and Emily's job would be 100 times harder and couldn't get those 30 um, playoffs done um, in the right time. So, Can I just yeah. touch on... Something you were saying there, Chow, you were talking about the engineers learning the software to an extent. It just made me think of essentially the sort of relationship we've had over the last few years where obviously I'm no engineer, but part of my role ended up being media management, which I wouldn't have been able to do without Chowie teaching me how to do it. And it's been a few years and I don't think I'd remember now. But it's... I'll come always back and train you. I can't afford your day rate, mate. Um, but it's always been interesting, particularly when I was in at the new Channel 9 building when it started, and there are gremlins and bugs like there are when you start any outside broadcast. And it's always been interesting. Chowie and I have worked together quite a lot. I've, I've, as I said, I've got no engineering background, but having been on the road a lot and being left to my own devices, you tend to learn a lot out of necessity. And... There's actually a great symbiotic relationship between editors and engineers at times when it comes to problem solving because, again, they know the back end and the ones and zeros and what cable's going where, but quite often the editor knows the actual software a lot better. And that's, that's I just want to touch on that's a part of collaboration in broadcast that you don't see a lot elsewhere. And it's quite rewarding when we sit and work out that there was a forward slash instead of a backslash. Or the time that on the computer. Yeah, well, I mean that's um, I've, we've mentioned a couple of times, um, obviously in our day to day lives, but um, I always found it's always much more enjoyable and more precise when you're trying to work out what's happening when you're having a conversation as an engineer to to an editor that has spent the time on the tools and um, doesn't necessarily that they, they do their work and this is how they do their work, but then they go and explore everything around them and then they can start bouncing ideas and having the technical discussion, even though they're, they are a creative, creative, some of them, um, and then be able to say, oh, well, I tried this, and I've tried this. Um, because when you also do support, you have your ABCs of what you have to do in particular order and, and troubleshoot and 
go back to the beginning and, and see what's going on with the workflow. But if you can already have that, um, those levels of support already done prior to someone kept rocking up to see what the matter is and what's going on, it does then save down the end, uh, much further down the track of what's actually going wrong. Essentially, yeah. you're saying, have you turned it off and on again yet? <laughs> well, yeah, that's not always the best. <laughs> One thing to to, to, to to mention that I think we've all we kind of discussed kind of briefly is of course working from home, which is something that we've we've all had to to do for the last the last little while. So again, we have a question which has come in from uh, Kabalski Solomon. Um, so so pre COVID, of course, a lot of your editing work would would take place you know in the office. Um, Emily, you you touched a little bit on this earlier on about working from home. So how how has that adjustment been um, to actually going from work from home? And what do you prefer, working from home or or working back in the suite? Well, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, it was a big change, I guess, initially. Um, I remember the day we sort of started, it was like, oh, nothing's working today. Um, all right, I need to get this piece on air. So I drove home half an hour from the studio with a hard drive, luckily with my exported edit on it, safe, um, and had to upload that to Dropbox. <laughs> but um, I think the adjustment has been pretty smooth, really. Um, luckily for me, for example, I had an edit suite sort of station set up at home already because I was just doing some small projects on the side um, and like, like a short film and stuff like that. And so for me, it was pretty straightforward. I, I just sort of embellished, I guess, the equipment a bit more, um, some proper audio monitors, for example. Um, but then I think it was probably a bigger adjustment for the producers, probably, I think, um, and, and, I, and the engineering team, I suspect, um, in figuring out what it was a safe workflow um, in, you know, getting vision to us, the most basic thing. Um, you know, if we're not going to be in the building at all, how's, how's that going to work? Um, you know, and I know that some other companies that have started um, last year doing some stuff with like working through VPNs and remoting into machines that are actually on site at the station and cutting remotely. And, and it's been interesting just um, talking to colleagues and um, comparing experiences. Um, I really love working from home. I, um, I've found that it's, uh, it helps with maybe work life balance a bit more. Um, especially if you are going to have a really long day, you can break it up a bit more and make it work a bit better for you. And so for me, like this year, for example, I was working from home three days a week and then I'd go in for show days. So, that was great because you'd get to be in on site, you know, actually seeing people face to face. So the social aspect was there. Um, but then, you know, you could prepare work from for to take home on a hard drive vision and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, there were definitely times where it was hard, but I think that everyone's on the same page and in the same boat and it's more a mindset thing rather than um, maybe a hardware or software challenge. It's just getting everyone um, on on the same team and willing to just problem solve. And I think that the last two years in particular has, you know, really made that apparent that um, problem solving is a huge, huge skill. And no matter what job you're in, you're going to be faced with um, unexpected challenges, like whether you're a, a DA and suddenly that you need to reset the system in an ad break or something um, and reload all your stories. Or if your, your biz machine freezes and there's a, a super up, up that you can't get off, you know, there's, you have to adapt, react quickly and just make a decision and stick with it. I think is the thing that, that's really helped me the most. Um, and then, you know, if it doesn't work perfectly, that's all right. It's mostly live television and that's how it goes. So you learn from that experience and you take that with you onto the next one. Yeah, I think, I think that's really the big good. one there is routine. Yeah. yeah. I think keeping that routine and obviously like from an engineering point of view, there was no, you, you can't work from home. I mean, you, we, as an engineer, you have to work with the security team, you work with the IT team because it's sometimes VPN into a, a state-of-the-art broadcast system isn't practical. So you do mm. need to put on your mask, take hand sanitizer and go into the studio and, and separate from people and go and do things that you can't do from home and, and then be able to still, like I say, keep that broadcast running. But it's again, it all comes down to routine. What you can spend the most minimal time on on site. And then if you can, if it's designing a workflow, you can do that off site. So you you duck out, or you you work in teams with multiple people. It then becomes a challenge, obviously, when you have people that 
specialize in a particular area of the broadcast. And if you have a substantial amount of issues or something along those lines, you then have to bring in some key people and it's not always ideal to have them all in the same room at the same time. And it's just one of those challenges that you have to have to work with. Yeah, so lots of questions have come in. So a few questions to, to kind of go through here. Um, a question that's come in from a, from a couple of different um, uh, people really relate to how to get in and how to do, you know, things like networking. Um, so, you know, for, for example, here from, from, from Annie Postmas, who's come in and said, how as a student did you feel was the best way to reach out and make social connections, you know, even if you're inexperienced within the industry? I, mean, I know one thing that, that I did quite a long time ago was I began to follow people on Twitter. I began to follow, you know, editors and, and look for other people that were in the industry. So, I mean, Liam, what, what, what would be your advice on, on people trying to, to, to figure out, you know, that, those kind of connections? It's funny, I was just about to suggest Twitter myself, actually, as a great way to connect. Um, look, I was actually thinking M might be a good one. Like, that's sort of, because you came out of uni, you know, I didn't. Um, and you, yeah. were talk, you were talking about it earlier. You were on LinkedIn and you were finding people and adjusting yeah. your profiles. And Yeah. Yeah, so I guess... Um, it's probably even more relevant now with COVID because a lot of the places you could network in person, whether it be, you know, just uh, like a, a, an editor's guild meeting or something like that, they sort of don't really exist at the moment. So it, I can see how, like how something I viewed as difficult when I was in uni is so much harder to, right now. Hopefully it improves soon. But um, I guess for me, I was always on the computer anyway, and so I was very naturally inclined to um, use social media just to engage with people. Um, and so I think that there are a lot of resources online, um, whether it is, say, the Australian Screen Editors Guild or there are Facebook groups like um, um, Australia I Need Crew or Australia I Need Editors. And, and they're also... That's a great page. Yeah. And, and I've seen and, a lot of editors reach out to other yeah. editors or junior editors on that. It's amazing the amount of opportunities that seem to pop up there where, you know, I even now would be like, oh, God, if that if I hadn't seen that group, for example, I would have no idea how you could get some jobs on, on postings like that without already knowing someone. And for me, that's always been a chip on my shoulder being like, you know, like I've never known, like my parents weren't in the industry or, you know, like, like my uni degree was great and I'm so glad I got the placement out of it but beyond that it was a bit hard like it sort of just seemed like a big wide world and you know do your best like it's like I, I think so many people said to me like you know it's all about um who you know and being in the right um place at the right time and that has always really frustrated me because I'm like but what does that mean? Like, where is the right place and what is the right time? And I think that you can create a lot of your own luck by um, following people on Twitter, whether it's um, editors that you like from films that you've enjoyed, you know, check out their name in the credits or um, find out more information on IMDb. That's a really good resource as well. Um, and, you know, joining your local guild or union I think there are sometimes student rates and that sort of thing. So it's not quite as expensive as it might initially seem. And, and within those sorts of things as well, there are mentoring programs. So, you know, I joined the mentoring program for the Australian screen editors, I think it was a year ago, even though, you know, I'm not necessarily brand new. It's still a lot like a long way to go for me. I think, I, I think everyone can learn a lot from everyone they meet at every level. So there are, they also I, have their social evenings too, Em. That's like right. Those competition nights and things like that that are open to you don't have to be an editor to go to those. No, no, that's right. They're, they like they hold a lot of sundowners, for example, where people just sit and chat, and it's just like, oh, well, what are you working on? You know, and and I think um, just by engaging with people online, whether it's like getting into conversations on Twitter, you can make a lot of friends on there. They're also a lot of weirdos, so you got to be careful. But, you know, you... you... Match name names. <laughs> at, like, at Liam Burkery on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I think I remember someone said to me really early on um, when I was just finishing uni that one of the most important things I could do is to have an opinion, and I think that that terrified me because I was like, I don't want to offend anyone. And it's only in probably the last couple of years where I'm like, oh, I actually think I have an opinion now and I'm not, you know, terrified to share it. But I think 
like it's yeah it's a hard one it's a hard one you've got to make strategic decisions and there are ways to do that whether you are looking at um you know the producer that's hiring on linkedin you go and click like once you've built all of your uh profile to look as good as it can you go and click on their profile and your name will pop up on them they're going to say well who's this person and they might check you out it it all adds up to the big picture you know and something tiny like that can make a big difference so I think it's just having passion and being genuine as well, like not trying to totally fly by the seat of your pants. You need a little bit of that, but not yep. too much. The yeah, like things exactly like this session right now. It's joining me, so like Shauna and Dave done, and Avin have done an amazing job getting things yeah. like this run. It's joining now. You've already taken that first step. Like all of us are on, on LinkedIn. From an engineering point of view, LinkedIn's probably the starting point as I mean, a lot of us do have Twitter, but we don't have the creative stuff to show. We, we do jump on LinkedIn quite a lot and follow the tech resources, follow those tech companies. But for me, it's just a matter of also downloading those free softwares and going out and shooting something, doing something, and actually understanding how that technology works and use platforms like your Instagram and your Facebooks and, and publish something you've cut or if you like to, the way you do things on a meeting proposal and you've, you've done the trial, you've got meeting proposal first, then maybe go out and purchase a, a full license or potentially win one and uh, then get <laughs> and start building the workplace for yourself. And, and there's a lot of groups out there, like you say, that have a lot of experience and there's a lot of the, the broadcasters that do join those those groups and and sitting ACSR courses with Avid because then you join groups and discussion panels and things like that. So that there's definitely a lot out there. It's just being proactive and going getting out there and finding it. I think the other thing that, I guess this whole thing's been touching on is sure you may want to be an editor, but be willing to do anything, be it making cups of tea. I actually saw a friend of mine who you now works at Fox Sports tweeting the other day about getting started in the industry, being an intern, working for nothing, but just giving 110%, doing everything as well as he could. I, to be honest, I don't know how he got that initial foot in the door, but he made a point of not letting them get the foot out of the door once he was there. They had no choice because he'd given everything 110%, which Shaoi, being an engineer, will realise 110% is impossible. 100 is 100. But, um, I'm not great yeah, with maths. It seems fine. Let's do everything. Do the long hours, suffer. We all did, you know. And just don't put all your eggs in one basket. Understand yeah. that there is a wider world out there and if you do want to be an editor... I feel like I'm uh, trying to bring people to the dark side of these yes, engineers. So stop it. <laughs> but but like, yeah, there is, it's, it's one, I'm sure, it's wonderful being an editor, but there is, again, like I keep saying and I remind people all the time, if it wasn't for engineers, they wouldn't be editors. It's true. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Trust me. Sorry. It's even, it's, even, it's even better being a journalist. So never mind this rest of this technical <laughs> nonsense. You know, just get on the creative creative side. Um, so there's, there's lots of questions to get through, guys. A couple of resources I'll mention just to, to pick up on a couple of things that said there. There's lots of Avid forums that I think are great to, to, to look at online. There's the Avid, edit, Avid Editors of Facebook group, which is a great resource, um, again. And also, if you're looking to find out names of editors, um, you know, Emily talked about looking at the credits of films. There's also another podcast come up from Avid from my colleague, Matt Fury, called The Rough Cut. And it interviews, you know, lots of really great editors who are editing, for example, you know, the latest Bond film that's on there, the June team, there's loads and loads of ones that are there. So, you know, check out the Rough Cut po podcast and Matt Fury um, uh, online um, as well. There's lots and lots of resources which are, um, which are out there. So I've got a question here from, uh, from, from Julia Raven. So she's just completed two weeks uh, shadowing the edit assistant of a small company uh, and they've hired her to cover his holiday. Uh, so the first edit assistant jobs, what top tips and advice uh, would you give? Liam, what do you think about that? Um, look, I, not knowing where the edit assistant job is, that's also a world we've had edit assistants. I've worked with edit assistants, but working in the sport world, it's a strange world without that layer of prep. Um, but from a more holistic point of view, it's going to be scary. Every job is scary, especially when they're new. There will be, even though the other editors sorry, assistant editor's gone, there will be people there that can help you and don't let anything overwhelm you because all the resources are there, be it on the Avid website, be it a YouTube clip. There's no question that I've had trying to do something on Avid that I haven't been able to find with a Google search. 
So it's or a phone call so to me. True. <laughs> or a phone call or a phone call to Chow going, what's media offline mean, Chow? Um, <laughs> but yeah, and it's just reach out to people and phone somebody if you have to. Follow our hashtags, call us. It's but it's all it's all out there. And it's I guess the main thing is, and look, it might happen where you've got a scary, shouty producer or something like that. That's gonna make you feel bad. Don't let them get to you. Just give yourself time, compose yourself, and then deal with the problem. Going, okay, let's. But if you've been doing it for two weeks and you're across it, back yourself as well. Yeah. yeah also, so another question. Sorry, Emily, you go. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I also think that, like, whilst it might seem like a stupid question to you, especially when you're really new, like, people don't care. You know, I think they would prefer that you ask the question and early so you can maybe get ahead of a problem or an issue or whatever, rather than let it snowball and then becomes a huge issue down the line that might actually um, cause an issue with the broadcast or slow something down like that. It's just get on top of it early and it's hard. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would always argue that there's no such thing as a stupid question. I have, however, given lots of stupid answers. <laughs> um, so an, an, another quick question that's come in here uh, is, is someone who's doing part a, a unit as part of their, 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 their film and, and TV Taffy course called Edit for Fast Turnaround. What's the average kind of turnaround time when you have to cut and deliver your jobs? I guess that really depends on the kind of job that you're doing. For, for something like the grand final, Liam, I guess everything has to be quick, 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 but there's other stuff that obviously takes a long time. The grand final is a good one because mm. I need to cut a playoff that goes at a half time. So I have 40 minutes to cut that 45 second piece. And then yep. there's another one at the end. So I've got 80 minutes to cut a minute 45 piece. That's not really an average thing. That's quite a different thing. Um, look, there is no, there's no set time. Over the years, I've learned how long things take. Like I know to, I'll, I'll use my, my field of expertise as a rule to do an opener for the state of origin, which might be two and a half minutes, and they're pretty big because it's a big audience and it's prime time you usually want to give those two or three days to cut two and a half minutes at the same time to cut a good six minute feature story. I'd like to give that two days, but then at the same time I've been working on OBs where I've had two hours to cut a six minute feature story. You can still do it. I cut a 45 minute documentary on Harold Holt, our missing prime minister, which I got to spend six months on. Um, so, yeah, in broadcast in particular, it's I've, I've never found that there's a certain, I guess the alternative to that is what I've learned to do, and I'm sure Em's in the same boat, is I've learned to look at the workload I may have for the week and set myself goals going, I really need that finished by then. I can give this a day. I can give that half a day, and then I can knock over those couple of things in a couple of hours. But, again, that that sort of comes with 20 years of editing. A lot of that also goes down in this particular world that I've been working on in rugby. I've cut everything. So I have really good knowledge of what footage I have and what I'm going to use before I cut. Sometimes when you're doing a story, you, you might want to spend a day just sitting going through rushes without even cutting. And at times that you might not feel like you're not getting anywhere, but Essentially, when you're doing that, you're cutting the story in your head. Mm. On a lot of jobs, the actual editing is the easy bit. The hard bit's making sure you've got everything to put in. And when you've done that work of making sure you've got all the bits you need, putting it on the timeline's easy. Another question here, and I, I, forgive me for being in the UK, but I'll have to rely on your geographic skills for in Australia. So uh, do you know, guys, what the opportunities are in Western Australia with learning editing skills on the job? I'd really like to gain some editing skills and shadow someone while I'm currently studying uh, sound production. So I, I don't know if anybody there can give any any particular advice on that one. I, I, I get the same have... anywhere in Australia. Mm. I think it's, it's the same in Western Australia have a, have a channel nine as well. They have their, their own stations down there. Sorry, over there. Um, I'm based out of Sydney, so I'm not sure exactly um, where they're all located in Western Australia, but 
it's those again it's those forums that um and these sorts of events um that doesn't matter where you live you know, have the same opportunity and, and jump out and, and reach out there's there's also opportunities away from broadcast with editing especially in this day and age with this digital world there are so many people looking for editors at so many different levels as well they somebody cutting social media videos or even real estate companies employ editors corporate. full-time corporate. Mm. There are all these other places to look, wedding videos, et cetera, you know, all these people. So, and again, that's that sort of touches on something that I meant to mention earlier when we are talking about the foot in the door in broadcast because now all these companies have digital sections. They're not looking for editors that have 20 years experience they're looking for people that are starting and i've seen quite a few people go from being so well wide world sports is one example we have a girl who is she's now the producer of the sports sunday magazine show and a rugby league magazine show she started off as the social media girl when she was a junior she's now producing live tv so all these there's all those extra pathways too yeah, definitely. I think I can agree advice about the different range of, of things that have come in. So another question that's coming here from, from Lavania, uh, a slightly different one, um, but it's about differences in workflow uh, that you perhaps have seen using Final Cut, Premiere and, and Composer. I guess, Emily, you touched this earlier on. The, the basics are the same, the diff different tools, but there can, of course, there's different workflows for lots and lots of different things. So what do you think of that one? Um, I think probably the most obvious thing for me um, I haven't really used Final Cut since uni, but going between Premiere and Avid, I'd say the main thing that stands out to me is potentially the ingesting of media. I think that's the main difference between Avid. Uh, I think it can be um, a bit of a steep learning curve with Avid, especially if you're not like learning off someone and you're trying to self-teach uh, online. But, um, yeah, otherwise I think um, they're pretty similar for the most part. I think um, Premiere maybe has a different sort of effects palette that's built into the Abbott one. Um, but otherwise, it's all relatively similar. Okay. I really think, yeah, that that ingesting is the, is the thing that sort of tripped me up probably and confused me the most when I was um, when I was sort of getting started. I think that goes down to the fact that Premiere sort of almost works more with Windows Mm. Where you're working with the Windows tree a bit when you're dealing with the new, yeah. Media, but then at the same time you're still Source building browser and all that sort of stuff the same. Yeah, I've, yeah. But this is the whole discussion about Premiere versus uh, Resolve and Media Component things like that. Was we spent months on when you design a, a platform, broadcast platform in particular, because you know there's not just the, the front end edit client that you're you have to worry about there's the back-end storage, there's the databasing, there's the, the mass media asset management, all that sort of stuff. What uh, What is really good about the Avid side of things is you do have the, the, the production system that is already established from, from, from Avid that is an international used production system and the MAM system that sits over the top. At the end of the day, there's hundreds of MAM systems out there. There's hundreds of, of PAM systems out there and storage. Um, but the way that is built at the production site, whether it's a, big 600 plus site like like nine is or or it's a, a standalone little garage unit like like yours there it, it all depends on the landscape what you're actually using it for what mm. we found was meeting composer was very good because it was the very corporate things came in and mass amounts of media we're talking petabytes of media um, premiere did a lot of really good things with, with people on the road the cameraman just wanted to have a laptop plug the camera card in cut something really quickly export it out and and deliver it where it needed to go. That might be much more useful than than a full blown media composer computer on the road. Uh, but it all, it all comes down to what where you actually work and the, the technical landscape and and what the actual end goal is. Well, I've found this year in particular from the salubrious surrounds of my garage where I've been working, I've got literally fifty plus hard drive sitting here and at any one time I've had 30 or 40 terabytes plugged into my computer but this year like obviously I can't ingest all of that media but I've been AMA linking a lot of this year and I've 
almost exclusively been working with stuff AMA linked, which I've never done before. So it's very much horses for courses, depending on what job you're doing. If if I'm pulling in MP4 clips that people are sending me, I ingest those. But when I'm dealing with 300 gigabyte match records in DNX HD, I'm just linking to those. And I've been quite successful in relinking them back as I go back to old drives and swap them around. And and that's I've actually found that quite interesting this year. But again, that's that's more about adapting to the situation. And I think as well, that also then wraps up. Yeah, it wraps up nicely the discussion we're having before about getting into into this workspace. And it's a matter of not not putting all your eggs in one basket. I'm only going to learn Avid. I'm only going to learn Final Cut. It's understanding. Okay, well there are the three potentially four big players, um, and understanding that it is the back. If you put it all back to the bare bones, they are the same. Media in, edit, media out. Do some things, do things differently. Some work a lot better than others in some areas, but I don't think there is one complete hierarchy standout that says this is by far the best in every situation. Um, understanding on everything that happens in the background, like the media centrals, the MAMs and PAMs and companies like Avid and Uala and all that sort of stuff. It's understanding all everything and how it works in the environment and then um, moving forward and saying, okay, oh, well, I, I have experience in these different platforms. I know how to use them. How do they fit into your workplace? Mm. So we're, we're, we're run a little bit over time, uh, guys. So it's one final question really I'd ask each of you is if there's one thing that you would say to people about trying to get into the industry, what would it be? So Emily, I'll start with you. Um, I think the big thing I would say to everyone is just to say yes. I think if I reflect on um, my time, uh, both as an editor and just across various roles, um, working in news and all that sort of thing, um, some of the biggest highlights or I guess the moments that I'm proud of have come from being terrified and just thinking, you know what, just say yes, have a go and you'll figure it out. You know, whether it's um, there was a big storm in um, Newcastle the early morning and no one was at work and they're like, we need, we need to do a live update because it's quite serious. There's no vision switcher or director. There's no audio guy. Um, someone just turned the camera on and I was like, that's fine. We can figure it out. I, I, I can switch and I can do all the DAing and stuff. And and then I sat there for a few minutes when everyone was getting ready. I was like, why did I do that? I don't know if I can do all this. But then it worked out. You know, you make it work. It's live TV. Things happen. But at the end of the day, you sit back and you go, wow, like I, I think back to where I thought I could be and I'm far beyond that because of saying yes and trusting myself and also trusting the people around you, you know, they're there for a reason. Um, and there's a wealth of knowledge everywhere you look. And I guess it's just engaging with that. Yeah. Andrew. Uh, there is no guidebook on exactly the right pathway to get in. It's trust yourself. Don't put all your eggs in one basket and understand the tools that are out there. Be adaptive and understand that change is inevitable. Failures are inevitable, but it's what you do with those to then make that next move. It's don't fall in love with one idea because that one idea will change all the time. And, and over a, a very short period of time, something will come up that will might not necessarily agree with you or the way you think, but um, it's agreeing with change and accepting that it is going to happen. Um, and, you know, trust yourself. It might not seem right, it might not seem comfortable at the time, but it's always a changing industry and there's people there to talk to you and help you. So listen to them and, and reach out to them more importantly. Yeah, and Liam? I guess saying ditto is not enough, is it? <laughs> I, think, I think those two have really touched on all the things I wanted to say. Like, as Chowy pointed out, this industry changes so quick. I don't think there's many that change this quickly. Um, and again, the jobs change with it, so just be flexible. But the other thing is, if and when you get a foot in the door, be work experience, anything, be keen, ask questions, don't sit there quietly. If you're watching something happen and you don't understand, you want to understand, ask. Because I've had lots of work experience kids and other people come through and some just sit there silent. Others are curious and want to be involved and they're the ones that you go, well, why don't you have a go on the mixing desk? I'll show you what to do. It's okay. We can fix it up again. Um, and, yeah, it's just be keen. Because... Yeah. It's, it's one of the main things, you know, with 
people that have come through, there's just something you see in some people going, they get it. And it mightn't be that they get editing. It mightn't be that. It was just, it might even be, oh, that, you know, you've asked them to find a few shots of a football player or something. And it's very easy to find shots of players, but then it's a whole other kettle of fish to find good shots to edit with. And it's just, yeah, people, if you get to that stage, people will remember if you're good. So, yeah, just try and leave an impression. Don't be nerdy and come join technology. <laughs> yeah, I think, that's, I think that's great advice. I think one of the things when I was hiring in my, in my previous career before I joined David as well was also looking at people that had volunteered, you know, people that had done mm-hmm. stuff at their local hospital radio station, for example, or had done a week's work experience at a local radio station and things like that as well, because that's all about the kind of wider kind of um, willing to be adaptable and things like that. It's not down to what is on the CV. It's definitely not all about that. I think you've, you guys have summed up really, really well about, you know, attitude, about being willing to adapt, about, you know, looking for opportunities and taking them as well. So it's been, it's been a fantastic discussion. So a couple of final things that I've got to say before we, uh, before we finish. The most important one, I'm sure everyone's been waiting, uh, is that we have got a winner for the Media Composer license. So congratulations to uh, Solomon Kowalski and thanks so much to everybody um, who has submitted uh, questions. Uh, Solomon and Shauna Sean, Sean will be in touch uh, to, to arrange that for you. Um, so for me, really, I just want to thank uh, particularly our guests today, to, to Liam, to Andrew, and to, and to Emily. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. It's been great uh, to have the discussion, and I think lots and lots of good, you know, helpful and, and, and practical advice. Uh, stay tuned, obviously, on the Avid social channels for uh, information about the next um, Inside Track uh, webinar that we're going to be doing. Uh, and for me, thank you very much for attending. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Bye.